So good to be with you. What we're going to do is we're going to start off by showing you a very quick video. And I just like to get your thoughts as to what you hear when you watch this. Athletes today have it harder than we ever had it by far. I walk in at halftime and this every coach in the NBA, every guy's on his phone. Yeah. Really? Yeah. The danger is you have all that judgment and criticism at your fingertips. And uh, I don't know how to survive in that bubble with all that criticism and judgment and anger coming at you all the time and still be able to function and play at a high level. It's, it's incredible. You know, I write books and the, they say like, never read the bad stuff and never read the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like actually both sides right. are problematic because they're, so, right. they're so weighted with judgment. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I quit Twitter five, maybe five months ago. Thank you. It's a huge achievement. Wow. Yeah. That's all I did it with James Wiseman, our rookie. You know, he was having a rough season and he was taking some criticism. And I asked him, are you reading stuff? And he goes, yeah. And I said, how's it feel? He goes, feels lousy. So I said to James, let's, what do you think? Let's, let's quit together. So we did it. And I just realized I don't need this. I think this is actually much healthier, but I, I also understand I'm probably neglecting some of my, my duty as a citizen to make people aware of what's, what's yeah. happening out there. Let me ask you something. What what do you think the biggest differences the modern athlete has to deal with that you didn't when you were an athlete? Probably the, the, the biggest is is probably parents. Parents. That's the number one thing. I mean, here's why. And I, I get it. Because when I first got into coaching, I was actually younger than than my parents. And now that I've been in the game for 22 years, I'm older mm -hmm. than our parents. And I, and I feel like the parents are super invested, which is great. They love their kids. Um, they are, you know, they want to turn return on their investment because they put a lot of money into their children um, to play in AAU, uh, to have trainers. Um, so they're, they're vested. You know, and they they're like, you know, if you put your money in the stock market, they're like watching it every day. <laughs> and that can be, you know, that could be a detriment because you see it go up and down and up and down. And then you, you're on a roller coaster, emotional roller coaster. You know, sometimes you got to just sit back and let it grow. Um, and I just feel like, you know, they are, you know, I, and I'm going to just I've, I've been around, you know, parents for the past 22 years. Um, they they love their children so much. Like the the you know they don't. They they there's no escaping how much they love their children. What I find is uh, pretty pretty hard for for me to swallow is that they don't want their children to hurt or to be uncomfortable, and that is probably the the, the very thing that hurts their their children and that. In order for you to really grow and be successful, you got to hurt. You got to be uncomfortable. You got to you got to find a, a fuel in life. And usually your fuel is when you haven't done, you know, your very best. And it fuels you to continue to work on doing your best, being your best and navigating through a society that that's pulling at them and they have really high expectations of them you know, to, to see themselves on, on social media, to get the likes and all of that. So they, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure from pretty much every, every aspect of their life. So you, you were saying when you got into it, you're younger than the parents and now you're older. How has anything changed with your approach on how you deal with the parents from day one until now? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I have conversation, like we are, you know, I include them in, in, in how I'm coaching and mentoring their daughters. I include them in on it. Like, I and don't shut them out. Like? What does it look like? It looks like, you know, it looks like I have, I have monthly Zoom meetings with all the parents, all of them, just to check in and just make sure that, you know, this is what's happening here at the beginning of the season. Um, we have a, a Zoom. Um, just to let them know exactly what's going on. It's what you're, what 
this is what your daughter's feeling right now and it's new, you know, they'll get through. And then right before the season, we'll have one to say, hey, you know, we got a pretty good team this year. You know, your, your daughter, some of them will go through some things that they haven't gone through before. Like some of them won't play. Playing time is going to be, you know, something that is going to, it, it'll, it'll be there or not. Um, and that's something new for them as parents. Like you're used to seeing your, your daughters play and play a whole lot and play integral law um, outwardly. Um, and, you know, some of those roles are going to be different for some of your, your daughters. Some of them are just going to have to help us prepare to win instead of really getting out there. And that's going to take, you know, that's going to hit you hard as parents. So I just want you to be prepared for it and know that uh, trust the process. Just t trust the process. Those who have trusted the process, you know, more times than not, probably 90% 90, 90 of the time or, or, or above, it, it usually works out pretty darn good uh, for their careers. You know, Dawn, anytime they, you hear coaches say that anybody inside the environment can be a leader, even if they're not directly contributing with buckets or rebounds or whatever, can you give us a nuanced moment that describes that point that someone who doesn't get much recognition did something very important for the team that will go unnoticed by the masses? What moment comes to mind for you? Well, I mean, we we had uh, we had a roster of, of sixteen, which is way above what you what what a normal roster looks like, and way above anything that we've we've coached. Like we've had like a eleven or twelve player roster, you know, which is you know pretty easy to manage. To manage sixteen um, is a lot. It takes a lot of communication. Um, I, I would say. For for us, the we 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 have a we have a practice squad, a male practice squad that prepares us when we're at home. But then when we go to a place like the Final Four, we 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 can't we don't have them. We utilize the the five players on our roster to get us ready. And I I just you know I just constantly tell them how much we appreciate them for getting us ready. And then, you know, when we won a championship um, and then I, my, one of my first interviews about this season, I shouted them out individually because they're the ones that don't get the spotlight at all. So I wanted to shine the spotlight on them for preparing us. You know, they were, they were, they were North Carolina who we played in the sweet 16 they were Creighton, who we played in the Elite Eight. They were um, they were were uh, Louisville in the semifinals, and then they were Connecticut in the finals. Like they prepared us with very little playing time, and I just wanted to make sure that they understood. But then they, you know, they 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 were embracing their roles even to the very end. So. There wasn't really a aha moment. It was just they seamlessly accepted their roles and and prepared us as well as they could prepare us. And I do attribute, you know, them with really helping us win a national championship. And that is so rare. Oftentimes, coaches can neglect the end of the bench. Have you gotten feedback for you? I guess the question I would have is, how do you keep them engaged when this isn't necessarily the role that they signed up for, but it evolved into it? I mean, it, it's constant communication. I think people want to, young people want to be valued. They want to, they want, all they want is to the, the feel like they're making an impact. And it usually is directly, um, related to playing time. And we had to try to, you know, flip the switch on them and just, just have them really understand their value. It is it, not a glorified role. It's not one that, you know, you would just, 
you would just say, oh, let me embrace this role. I want this one. You know, it's an unappreciated role that we that we made sure that we appreciate time and time again. Like, you know, you can't just say, oh, that's that's what you're supposed to be doing, although that's what they're supposed to be doing for our team. It's what they're supposed to be doing. And what we're supposed to be doing as coaches is valuing their roles. And we, you know, we we did that pretty often. So, you know, we took the onus off of them, you know, their minds going to a place of not playing a whole lot to their minds being valued. And when you're when you're valued, when you feel loved, you know, you do your job and you do it to the best of your ability and you do it without complaint. The thread that keeps coming back is communication from you. My question to you is an NBA metric that a coach uses. He asks himself when he's dealing with an athlete, how close can I get to an honest conversation? What has to be in place for you to get close to that? Well, I, I, and that's hard. That's probably what, you know, every athlete is to, to have that. I think, you know, what, what, what I do every day of the week, every, you know, every, you know, when I, when I work with young people is um, don't judge me off of one conversation, judge me over the time that I've interacted with you. And that's what young people want. They want, they Why want to say to, that because they, they want, they want you to trust them and you want them to trust you and trust is, and I just had a conversation with one of our younger players yesterday. And I, I really had to explain to her trust isn't, isn't the only form of you receiving it. Like she wanted certain things to happen. Um, during one of the during one of the worst times in in her career, her young career, she wanted us to be a certain way, and we in turn wanted her to be a certain way, <laughs> and we we never got there. But the fact that I had to explain to her, like we're we're not your parents, like we're not going to trust you like your parents because your your parents had. 18 years to build that trust. And you had 18 years to build the trust with them. I mean, we don't have that. This is our first year together. So, and, and you have to understand that trust comes in different forms. Like I told her, and she did something that, you know, that hurt our team. And she she didn't apologize, which, I'm okay with this. Well, you know, most young people don't really understand how to. Do you, you know, address to, it with the whole team collectively when that no. happens? You just let it ride. No, I don't address it with the whole team because that's not how they operate. So I, I told her that the fact that you came to practice, this happened a while ago, but I had to, but it came back up in our end of the year meeting. So she wanted, she wanted us to, to act a certain way towards her. Um, and, and we, we didn't, we didn't give her that, you know, so she took that as, you know, her not trusting us because we didn't respond in the way that she wanted us. And I said, well, you didn't apologize and you didn't, you didn't respond in the way that we wanted, but what you did do is you practiced hard and you prepared us. And that was that was an apology in itself, because you didn't you didn't uh, you you didn't you know you you didn't you didn't you didn't outwardly um, give us any any issues. You didn't fold. You know you were actually more vibrant, and you had some of your best practices of, of the entire year That's powerful. when that happened. And I said, that is, you know, that's me trusting you. <laughs> that's me trusting you, you know, and then to put you in a game, to put you, you know, in the tournament is me trusting you. And I just had to explain to her, trust is you got to open your heart up 
to for 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 trusting in 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 a variety of ways because what makes it hard for that, young people don to hear you when you're saying that say that again what makes it hard for young people to hear you when you're saying that because it's different you know i mean young people you know no matter and, and basketball players and athletes we're creatures of habit so we're used to hearing you know the same things and we're used to doing the same things we got you know, we just have, you know, we're habitual when it comes to our stuff and anything that's different. I mean, it, it throws our equilibrium off a little bit. But again, don't trust me off of one conversation. Don't trust anyone off of one conversation. Because, you know, we can, you know, we're 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 great with words. We're recruiters, you know, we are. We are people who are pretty persuasive, um, you know, but we are people that sooner or later, who we are will come out, <laughs> who we genuinely and organically are, you know, will come out. And as young people, you're either gonna like it or not. And that's, that's, on, that's on each individual person to figure that out. I know that when I can, when I can be who I am with uncensored uncensored me, um, I, I know over the my years of coaching, that is what my my former players, my current players, and my future players really enjoy and like that I'm I'm me, and I've been very fortunate to be me for probably 90% of my career. Like I don't ever felt like I, I had to be anybody different. You know, did I have to pivot? Yes, you know, I pivot very often, but me pivoting does, it, it does not impact my core values. The pivot is not saying, you know, I'm gonna lower my standards. It is finding another way to reach a, play, a player in a way that they can understand it, they can receive it, and they can be better because of it. I understand how intentional you are with your approach and how you lead. And so much has been made with the sideline wardrobe. How do you process that? I don't know. I mean, I mean, for me, I, 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 I like, I like nice things. I mean, I grew up in the projects. In North Philly, I didn't have a, not a lot of nice things. Couldn't afford a, a lot of nice things, but you know, it, it never stopped me from imagining, and never stopped me from window shopping, and never shop, stopped me from looking at magazines. And then when I'm, you know, when I'm in a position where I can afford what I wear and what I like to wear, um, that's what I do. I, if I feel good, I look good. I, I feel like it's a direct correlation with with playing well and performing what do you well. make though of so many people commentating around that i mean it's i mean our game is full of narratives so it's just one more narrative that you know some people like it some people don't some people you know it's it's commentary you know it, it is a, a layer to to our game man you know if it's if, if they're talking about what i'm wearing um, during a game means somebody's watching. <laughs> I, prefer, I prefer them watching, watching women's basketball. Hey, man, you know, it's so funny because I think the higher ups are like, well, what about Under Armour? What about this? And they, again, like you said, make narratives. But I think the younger people are like that drip, that swag, that's the energy that her team plays with. How do you think about that? I mean, it's true. I mean, young people are, you know, young people are, um, you know, they like the labels, they like the materialistic stuff. Um, you know, I mean, I, I like it too, but I can afford it. Like, you know, I don't know <laughs> if they can, they can afford it. I, I can afford it. So I, I want people to, to stay within their means. Um, and, and, and not everything I wear, I buy. 
So that's a, that's a, some of it is given to me. So, you know, people make a big deal out of it, um, but some of it's given and I don't mind receiving and I don't mind wearing it. I, you know, it's, if it's a pretty cool piece um, and we win in it, it gets a chance to, it gets the chance to be seen again. If we lose in it, I don't wear it ever again. <laughs> not, not not in a basketball setting. Where not. <laughs> yes, I don't wear it again. That is hysterical. I, I know that so many people talk about how honest you are and that it's an investment in your credibility and that you're shaping the next generation of leaders. I, I want to ask you this. As you look at these answers, we ask a bunch of people, what are the most common things that get in the way of your team maximizing its ability? And as you can see, here's all the different things that they come up with. My question to you is, as you're developing your leadership inside your team, what is the leader's role in attacking these issues in your mind? Leaders lead different ways. Like, I, I want our players to be as authentic to themselves as possible. Um, so well, this is what we do to find out who's, who's gonna be our captains, our leaders. Anybody that wants to be a captain must um, let us know, that's one, raise your hand, okay? After you raise your hand, you know, we, we figure out how many people wanna be leaders and we bring them up to the room, right? And our entire program, that's everybody, players, coaches, you know, support staff, we're all in one room and we basically ask them why they want to be leaders. They got to answer them. And then we, we just fire off different questions to them. You know, we set up hypothetical situations and how they would handle certain things. And, and then after that, we take a vote on who would best represent our, our team as a leader. And I think from, from those answers, uh, and, 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 and how they interact with, with, uh, with our, with everybody in our, you know, in our program, um, they're the ones that, that stand out and they're the ones that are, end up being our, our, our leaders. And we allow them to lead in their own way. Like I, I tell our leaders pretty much don't come to me until there's something that you can't handle. Like you got to exhaust different ways of leading through um, problematic issues. Um, and then when you've exhausted everything and you can't do anything, come to me and then, and then we'll work some things out um, and I'll maybe give you another way to approach it. Like I, I want them to work it out. Um, our, our, our captains and leaders spend most of the time, most of, most of the day, um, in the dorms or apartments with, with their teammates. So I don't know what's going on there. They know what's going on. So I, I just tell them to work it out. Um, and the, the biggest thing that we do talk about is communicating, like getting ahead of problems. Like if you, you know, I, I, my barometer of success or failure is um, it, it has a certain look, sound, or feel. Like, and, and use that as your moral barometer. Like, if, if, we're, if we're practicing and I hear one of our players say something derogatory to a, another teammate or coach or just out, you know, and, you know, it'll make my, it'll make my, my face cow. And I, I'm, I'm either going to say something which I usually do, I, I'm usually gonna say something, I'm gonna hit it right when it happens. Um, so, cause it made me, it made me adjust. It made me adjust to my, my face, adjusted to what was said. And I'll, I'll address it. Just like if I hear something that's super positive, you know, it'll, it'll make me smile and I'll stop practicing. I was like, hey, what'd you just say? I'll make them repeat it and I'll make them repeat it again. And I'll tell them, this is what we want. This is how to be a great teammate. 
This is the kind of behaviors that we need to we need to um, 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 continue displaying. Um, and that that's it. It's look down the field. If something makes you um, pause, you got to act on it. You can't let it continue because they're going to think that's the norm and that's not the norm. Um, so I, I think that's that's how we. That That's is how such we, a powerful way to reinforce, Dawn. And my last question around that is because you said that they're with them away from the facility. When did you as a coach realize that what they do away from you, away from practice, is just as impactful to their performance as what they do with you? Uh, I mean, I, I don't speak a whole lot about when, when I was an athlete, because I'm much, much different than them. Like I was, I was singularly focused on my career and that ain't the way to do it. It's not, it's not. <laughs> um, but there are things that contribute to your success. Again, I've had, I just had our end of the year meetings with you know, most of our players, 90% of them. And I, you know, I told one, one a, a different player that, that she has too many distractions, like too many, like she's made huge strides, you know, huge strides, you know, but there, there are things that seep in into your strides that, that if you got rid of those things, you would be a heck of a player, like a heck of a player. And I told her she's got too many distractions off the floor. Off, I mean, like if I, I told her, if your friends, if your friends aren't pushing you to go get extra workouts in, they're not for you. And if, if your friends aren't going to the WNBA or trying to be successful or see themselves being successful in the next three to four years, y'all not equally yoked. <laughs> I told her that was exact. Y'all not equally yoked. And I, and I said, not in a biblical terms, but in a, in a future, you know, successful terms, you're going to, you're going to be who you hang around with. They're either going to push you forward or they're going to pull you back. And there's no in between. There's no in between. Um, and I just told her to choose, choose yourself, like choose you, your your success over everybody else's success. And when you, when you, when you're, and I say you're young, you don't really get it right now, but I'm gonna keep talking to you about it. So, you know, one day it will click for you and you'll have that aha moment. And then it's all downhill from there. You'll, you'll understand and you won't allow anything else to, to be a distraction in your, in your career path. 